Okay, good morning and welcome. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. I uh, want to request any of us to please lead in prayer. So feel free. Okay, we'll pray. Yes, we'll like to in practice. Uh, ma'am, am I audible? Uh, yes, ma'am, am I audible? Okay, sure. Okay, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and beautiful morning, Father God. You include your presence, Father God, towards us. Father God, this time, we choose to praise you, choose to worship you, Father God. We choose to give thanks to you, Father God, for all of us, Father God, for all our, our lives, Lord. As we're going to, this time, as we're going to learn your word, Father God, from Book of Acts, Lord, we pray that, Lord, just Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us, Father God, so that we will learn the deeper things, Father God, and we will go deep and deep, Father God, in your truth, Father God, and we will pursue more of you, Father God. We will know you in a more, in, in a more way, Father God, and we ask you, Lord Jesus, Father God, you move around us, Father God. We commit all this time to your mighty hand, Jesus. We submit Pastor Nancy to your mighty hand, Father God. Let Use her in a mighty way, Father God, so that the, whatever the word will come, it will come through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. We commit all things to your mighty hand, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abhinash. Um, as we are aware, we've been, um, you know, looking at the book of Acts and covered up to Acts chapter 7. So today we are going to do Acts chapter 8. We'll do it slightly differently. Uh, and uh, by that I mean we will read through the entire passage and then I will kind of, you know, um, uh, share from it. Not that I'm going to summarize it uh, and make it very short, but wherever the emphasis required scriptures in those places there'll also be an emphasis um the uh, easy part about acts 8 9 and maybe even 10 is uh, it's more like it's it's already uh, you know uh, been narrated like a story by uh, luke but uh, more so you know in these passages we can see um uh, different events unfolding and so it's it's easier to follow so uh, I again require volunteers it's a rather long passage Acts chapter 8 so maybe one of us can read uh, um, you know Acts chapter 8 and uh, verse 1 to 20 and the next person can read from verse 21 all the way to verse 40 a little slowly so the class can understand what is going on. So, yes. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose, arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And the divine man carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattering them everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord hated the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called si Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all give gave head from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, 
in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come, then prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they lay, laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that truth delaying on one of the apostles, hence the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Thank you, Asha. Uh, we would require another volunteer to read from verse 21 till verse 40. Can I go? Yes, please, Charles. Um, I'm using another version. You have no part or share in this ministry. Because your heart is not right before God, repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord, and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Phil, Go thus to the Lord, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian Enoch, an important official in charge of all the treasury, of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians, this man had gone to Jerusalem to a ship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip to go to that chariot and said to he, and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of the scripture the Inaka was reading. He was read like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can, what can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Charles, for reading the remaining portion of Acts chapter 8. So uh, we will get started as uh, we have already seen the um, events continue from the death of Stephen. So we 
saw earlier on in Acts chapter 6 that there was a selection of seven volunteers to serve the church in their time of need. Uh, the time, the challenge which the apostles had was the distribution of food to the Greek speaking widows. And so they picked uh, people who uh, not just had the skill to meet the need but they were also people with spiritual capacity so we saw that they were filled with the holy spirit they had a good report um, and uh, you know these were people of wisdom uh, and so eight of these people were chosen and uh, the situation was taken care of and later on you know, while the church is growing, something else that we are noticing is that the opposition against the people of God is going to the next level. Earlier, the apostles, we saw from the healing of the lame man at the gate, beautiful, we saw that, you know, there was opposition after opposition uh, against the apostles. Earlier, it was uh, Peter and John, and later it was all the apostles who were questioned. But God had his own way. You know, uh, initially they were threatened and they were left. The second time, um, there was a word from a learned man called Gamaliel, and that was well received by the council. And so uh, they decided that if this is a work of God, then uh, nobody can stop it and which is how the apostles were actually let go then we saw that from that time onwards the persecution is becoming uh, sort of stronger against the believers stephen he was questioned he was accused wrongly and he gave a defense for himself and we saw the wisdom of god upon a man like stephen that even the people who were questioning him you know they they couldn't say anything uh, and and which is why they got frustrated and they made this uh, choice to kill stephen okay so they killed stephen um, so that's where we stop now after the death of stephen um, there seems to be the uh, mention of a man called saul who apparently was leading the uh, the killing of stephen so here again in in acts 8 verse 1 it says now saul was consenting to his death so uh, it shows us that this man, Saul, uh, we've seen that he was part of uh, that, that entire team that questioned Stephen. Uh, but also that whatever Saul did, he did it very willingly. So he was consenting to the death of Stephen. It wasn't a forced thing. So it just goes to show us how zealous Saul was for the things that he believed in. So obviously he believed that Stephen and the people of his uh, uh of his you, you may want to call like his congregation were against uh the jewish god and the jewish traditions and that's why saul was very angry and you can see that even in the uh, rest of this verse one and verse um you know verse, till verse three you can see that because we we are told that this man saul was consenting to the death and he was part of a great persecution that arose against the church. Okay, Now, when persecution arose, uh, we might think that the work of God uh, will stop. But see the mercy of God and the goodness of God, even in tough times. Scriptures tell us that from Jerusalem, what happened? Persecution started. People probably fled that place to save themselves, uh, but they ended up being scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So the apostles stayed back in Jerusalem, but the believers spread across the regions of Judea and Samaria. Uh, and therefore, you know, what can we expect? We will see as we go forward that these believers took the gospel with them so the gospel was not limited to jerusalem but it spread across the entire region so you know we thank god that persecution in itself is not the end of the gospel all this happened 2000 years ago and here we are today you know we are all people of uh, different nations different tribes different tongues continuing to speak 
the truth of Jesus, talking about the redeeming work of the cross, because no persecution that has ever risen against uh, the, the body of Christ uh, has been able to put a cap on the gospel the way. Jesus commissioned the believers and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Even up until today, the gospel is being shared. You know, and as Gamaliel said, if this is the work of God, nobody can stop it. So even persecution could not stop the work of God. People would have thought, the council and the authorities would have thought that they can uh, uh, threaten the believers and that will stop their enthusiasm but it was not a human enthusiasm but uh, it it was really the work of the holy spirit uh, in the lives of the believers that they got scattered but that resulted in the blessing of the church anyhow so even persecution um, in a way led to the spreading of the gospel and thereby a blessing to the kingdom of god so now believers are in Judea, they are in Samaria, there are open doors in new places to uh, talk about Jesus. And then you know, later again, we continue to read. It says, devout men uh, carried Stephen to his burial. So there were some uh, Jews who probably understood what Stephen was uh, sharing. So not all Jews were against uh, Stephen or maybe even the believers, but there were some who were against. There were devout uh, Jews who helped in the burial and they were quite sad about the death of Stephen. Uh, once again, there's a mention of Saul and it says he made havoc of the church. So the zeal of Saul, you know, you see again, the zeal of Saul against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, Paul later on makes mention of the zeal of his uh, in Philippians 3. I think it's verse 6. Uh, and, you know, he uh, by nature, by personality, uh, seems to be somebody who's passionate no matter what is on his plate. So earlier he was a passionate persecutor and later he was a passionate apostle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How passionate was he in the persecution? It says dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So uh, generally, even when it comes to punishing those who believe contrary to uh, the authorities, they would have some compassion on women. But you notice Luke writes, dragging of men and women. So that tells us that Saul was brutal in his persecution. He believed fully in what he was doing. He didn't care, you know, what gender you are, who you are, maybe even the age, but it shows us that you know he he was uh, a very um, convicted persecutor it also says house to house entering every house entering every house so then you see how passionate he was about um, dealing with those who believed in this jesus so that's a little bit about saul and later you know, we have the introduction of uh, uh, philip as a minister of god earlier also, the name of Philip is mentioned in Acts chapter 6. Uh, there we see him as one of those volunteers. So our idea about Philip is he is a, uh, a godly uh, person, um, that he is a committed person in the church. No wonder he was chosen to serve uh, in the distribution of food. But after that, there's a little bit more that we learn about the volunteers we learned about stephen what a testimony he's just a volunteer nothing more is mentioned in the bible about stephen uh, similarly at this point philip is a volunteer so what is philip doing we will read about that in verse 4 now again it says uh, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word so you see uh, the flip side of persecution it caused people to go everywhere wherever they went they preached the gospel and philip chose to go down to the city of samaria and what did he do he preached christ to them so notice how preaching christ 
or sharing the truth of Jesus was so integral to every believer. Earlier it says, those who were scattered. So our assumption is there must have been hundreds, thousands of believers you know, who probably got scattered. But it was just part of their lifestyle. Wherever they went, they preached the word. And similarly, you know, Philip being one of those believers, he went to Samaria, he preached Christ to them. Okay, And uh, scriptures tell us multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. So people in Samaria heard the word of God. What else happened? Um, they also saw miracles, it says. So hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So Philip began to, um, I wouldn't say began the ministry in Samaria. Other people may have gone ahead of him and, and done some ministry work, but there was some prominent work which Philip did in Samaria. Now, what is the importance of this place called Samaria? Samaria was known as, a, 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 you know, like a, a lower um, community of a community of they they were like mixed race you know uh, jews because apparently the assyrians had taken over and they had intermarried so the, the samarians were no longer respected by the pure jews uh, so uh, even at the time when we read about the lord jesus you know walking past samaria and meeting the woman uh, at the well in samaria so there was an inhibition that Jews generally had towards the Samaritans. So this was the inhibition that they they were not a pure breed, so to speak. So you know, among themselves, they, they were all among the Jews. There were all these classes and uh, you know uh, different ways of ways of uh, uh, honoring or dishonoring groups of people. So the Samaritans were a group which was not well respected. But see here, what did Jesus say in Acts one? Uh, in Acts one eight, you shall receive power, and the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So you notice that God promised for the gospel to touch the ends of the earth. God promised that beyond the Jews. You know, the Gentiles would hear the gospel. Uh, others would hear the gospel. And it's beginning to happen. It's actually beginning to happen. This was not an easy thing before, uh, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus' death and, uh, you know, his burial and resurrection. But after the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we see that the covenant was opened up to the non-Jews as well. So it's a very beautiful thing that ministry is being done in Samaria. Samaria, which was a so-called rejected community of people as far as the Jews were concerned. But for God, there's no rejected community. All are created in his image. And, you know, God um, loved the people of Samaria. So no wonder people when there, they were preaching Christ to them. And Philip went in and did some prominent ministry. So what was part of his ministry? Just like Jesus. Remember earlier in Acts 1, we said Jesus began to preach, teach, uh, and, you know, he also performed his healing uh, ministry. So there was a preaching and a demonstration of the work of God. So that was the proper kind of ministry which Jesus did. And the apostles followed uh, uh, in the same, you know, method of doing ministry. So what is Philip doing here? Philip preached Christ to them. And then it says, uh, what the, the multitudes he did him, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So Philip is preaching, but Philip is also demonstrating the kingdom of God. And then we read on verse 7. Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So notice how the ministry is so similar to the kind of ministry that Jesus was doing. Preaching, demonstrating, you know, 
part of demonstrating healing, deliverance, Philip's ministry is very, very similar. And people are experiencing uh, what is being done by the power of God. And notice verse 8 over there, very beautiful verse. It says, and there was great joy in that city. So how does the gospel impact cities of the world? How should it impact? cities of the world you know when the gospel comes firstly the truth of god's word reaches us reaches our uh, you know um, every part of our being that now we are redeemed because of the work that jesus has done for us we are saved we have salvation in christ jesus and not only that the release of god's power there must have been people who were sick and bound by sicknesses there must have been people who were oppressed uh, because of uh, the uh, works of demonic powers but here is philip coming and preaching the truth. So the truth has hit them. And not just that, the power of God has hit the city. So what is the result of that? There was great joy in that city. So you know, whenever we think of missions, whenever we think of preaching the gospel somewhere, remember this. As Philip ministered in, in the region of Samaria, there was great joy in that city. So our ministry, brings about you know, great joy when we preach Christ and we demonstrate the works of the kingdom of God. So as these things are happening, you know, we will uh, see the response uh, uh, of, of an individual as well. And uh, scriptures point out that there was a man by the name of Simon. Okay, So what is so uh, special about this Simon? We are told in verse 9, he practiced sorcery in the city and how well did he practice sorcery he was not just any sorcerer scripture also tells us astonished the people of samaria claiming that he was someone great okay and uh, here is simon who is probably one of those ace sorcerers doing his black magic witchcraft uh, you know depending on uh, the the uh, demonic powers for his supernatural works so he's doing it and he's doing it at a at a high level you know like a uh, uh, great level and his impact seems to be really uh, great because we are told he astonished the people of samaria so demonstrations of the supernatural through the life of simon it was incredible okay to what extent you know what uh, what was it great verse 10 we are told that they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is the great power of god you know, we ha this happens isn't it so when people see supernatural power uh, in and through somebody's life uh, they don't just honor that person they might call that person God. They might call that person, you know, uh, you are a force of God or you are the ability of God. In this case, they have named him the great power of God. Man is the great power of God. So in Samaria, Simon is an influential, if you want to say, you know, religious or spiritual, spiritual individual. Okay. Uh, now, what happens to Simon? But when they believed Philip as he preached, verse 12. So Simon is doing all these wonderful things. Uh, but Philip comes and he preaches. And when Philip preaches, okay, and uh, scripture also says that both men and women were baptized. So his ministry was quite effective. People heard him. And they came to faith in Jesus. And that is why men and women were baptized. So Philip is doing good ministry. Verse 13, then Simon himself also believed. Now think about this. Here is a man who is, uh, you know, uh, who is exercising and practicing uh, spirituality and in, so much in touch with with the supernatural, you know, uh, out of the wrong source, of course, you know, we know that. But even such a man who is exposed to the supernatural, 
believes philip for the word that philip brings okay and what else do we see simon was baptized and he continued with philip that goes to say that simon was born again the sorcerer was born again the sorcerer also wanted to become a disciple which is why he continued with philip and notice the last part of verse 13 what did we say about simon he was so well versed in the supernatural that he was called as the man the great power of god but last part of verse 13 says Simon was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So, something for us to learn here. You know, many times we look at uh, supernatural demonstrations, uh, and some of them we know are in the name of Jesus, some of them we know are from the kingdom of God. But we also look at the supernatural dem demonstrations which come from the kingdom of uh, Satan and you know the demonic world. And we say, look, even Satan is able to do miracles, even Satan is able to do the supernatural, but there is something greater about the supernatural which is released from the kingdom of God. Why am I saying it? from Simon's story, from Simon's, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, si the way Simon reacted to what he observed. He was already great in the supernatural. But after he becomes a believer, he sees Philip moving in miracles. And he was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. So the power of God is so much greater than the power of the demonic world. Yes, the demonic world can, can demonstrate a little bit here and there, but that's about it. You know, it can never compare to the supernatural power of the almighty God. So that is something you know we must recognize. And this is nothing new because even when we see the example of Moses, do you recall? He went back to the palace of uh, Pharaoh and there uh, the sorcerers competed with him. But in the end, what happened? The snake which uh, was, you know, the, the snake which came out of the rod of Moses, uh, it, it ate up all the other snakes of the sorcerers just to show that the power of God is way greater than anything that the demonic world can produce. So here is a sorcerer who is touched by the gospel. Okay, So from now on, we'll also begin to see different kinds of people, you know, some influential, some very simple, some in, uh, you know, government offices and, and, you know, some in business. So people of different strata of, of society responding to the gospel and how the gospel is not limited to only one class of people right we already saw that it's gone to the samaritans so that is a big deal in itself okay uh, and also um, various kinds of people being touched by the gospel so in this case simon an influential spiritual man becomes a believer he himself is amazed by the supernatural that philip uh, demonstrates okay now move on verse 14 what happens now simon we said is he a believer definitely because he believed so clearly luke wrote and then what does he say uh, he was baptized okay and he follows philip wherever he is going so he is growing in the things of god now what happens to simon and his faith now, that is what we are going to read uh, just before that we see in verse 14 that when Peter and John or the apostles in Jerusalem heard about the ministry of Philip. Okay, They sent Peter and John. So the apostles heard and they sent Peter and John. So again, you, you see this as a pattern in the book of Acts. You know, wherever uh, there are believers, it's great. It's wonderful. But something more needs to be done. 
remember in the great commission we have been asked to make disciples of all nations so even uh, as a young believer for me the only thing that i used to uh, want is to see people saved so i'll be very happy when you know uh, i hear oh so and so has accepted christ so and so is now a believer they are now saved and that seems to be the end uh, you know of of uh, what we expect uh, of people but in the bible just when people get saved the apostles seem to look at it as the beginning it was never the end so when we go somewhere and there is an evangelistic work which is uh, done evangelistic ministry takes place that's not the end it's the beginning so here is philip in samaria the report would have gone to the apostles in jerusalem that people in samaria have accepted christ now they would have said oh great wonderful you know clapped and all that and what did they do did they just sit back uh, and and relax and stay on in jerusalem no they realized that they have more work to do so the apostles now sent peter and john two more apostles so that these new believers in samaria can now be discipled okay so you will see throughout the book of acts that as much as evangelism is important discipleship is also equally important we will also see the deliberate effort of church planting so this is technically the beginning of the church in samaria so generally they uh, they would just call you know the church of a region so church planting is taking place so where do we get all these principles uh, that we practice today it's coming from the practices of the early church the early believers so as soon as they heard that in a given region there are believers that was the beginning you know of the of uh, the journey of the church of samaria so what did the apostles do come on peter and john get ready you know uh, take your uh, bus flight whatever go there verse 15 they came down peter and john they came down to do what it says they they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the holy spirit so do you see a pattern here very much because uh every time somebody accepted jesus christ they would be led into water baptism you know we saw that earlier also whenever peter preached water baptism was a common thing uh, and we um, are going to see from now onwards that holy spirit baptism okay though before this it's not mentioned no, in a in a in a uh, very specific manner it's understood because when you read about um, stephen a man who was moving who was might mighty you know performing mighty signs and wonders and philip who was also moving uh, in the supernatural it's understood that they were also baptized in the holy spirit okay so this is a pattern in the early church that you become a believer uh, be baptized in water be filled with the holy spirit so why did peter and john come all the way from jerusalem to samaria so that the samaritan believers may be baptized in the holy spirit so verse 15 uh, who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the holy spirit for as yet he had fallen upon none of them they only they had only been baptized in the name of the lord jesus so verse 17 how do they minister the baptism in the holy spirit so here we see then they laid hands on them and they received the holy spirit so sometimes today you know we we practice this when we are praying for people for the baptism in the holy spirit we lay hands on them why are you laying hands on them because we see this done in the book of acts now do we always have to lay hands on people for them to receive the baptism in the holy spirit not necessarily because in acts 10 we will see that cornelius and his household were baptized without the laying of hands okay but uh, there is a common practice which we observe which is laying of hands so peter and john came they prayed for these new believers laid hands on them and uh, they received 
the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So this is all happening in Samaria now. What else do we see? Okay. So Simon is observing, you know, what is being done by the apostles. Verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So Simon, as he's watching all this, one inference that we can come to is, there was something supernatural about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So maybe when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, one, we know earlier they spoke in tongues. So probably they would have spoken in tongues, which Simon viewed as something supernatural. There could have been healings. There could have been deliverances. You know, something has happened that impressed Simon. Now we know about Simon's background. He was into sorcery. So he has seen the supernatural you know, from the, uh, the, the negative side. But if Simon is impressed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the point that he's saying, I need this. Even if I have to give money, you please give it to me. It shows us that there was something supernatural that took place that, you know, at the time when Peter and John were ministering the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the people. Okay, If this was not so, why would Simon, you know, say, okay, I will give you money. I want this power. Definitely he saw something supernatural. That is why he's desperate to get that power. Okay, uh, and he says in verse 19, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So what Simon asked, we might think, wow, this man desires the Holy Spirit. Isn't that good? We might think that, yeah, that's so good. But again, you know, by the uh, discerning of spirits, you could say. Earlier in Acts 5, when Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they, they, they sinned in their hearts against the Lord, through a word of knowledge, Peter knew. And he said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Similarly, Peter, in the spirit, recognizes that Simon's motivation is not correct. He's asking for the Holy Spirit to be able to give it to others, which even we desire. Normal believers, we, we must desire that. But the motivation, the attitude with which Simon desired the Holy Spirit was so wrong. So in verse 20, Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. So you see, as scriptures tell us, God sees the deeper things. Man sees the outside, but God sees the heart. So for us as believers, our inner attitudes, you know, the way our heart is, when our heart is good ground, when our heart, you know, is, is aligned uh, and is obedient to God, God is pleased about that. But when we step out of that zone, God knows. And that's what happened in this case. Simon did not carry the right heart before God. He was trying to buy. What did Peter say? You want to buy the gift of God? How can you buy the gift of God? Is that the reverence that you have placed on the gift of God? Okay. So he rebukes him and he he even sort of you know it's it's almost like a curse he says that uh uh okay gift of god purchased with money you have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of god earlier he said your money perish with you okay so very strong words coming from peter but 
Peter also adds in verse 22, it's God's grace and mercy somehow towards Simon, where Peter says, repent therefore of your of this, of your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So God offered Simon forgiveness. And Peter is able to discern the spirit and the heart of Simon. So in verse 23, he says, For I see that you are poisoned with bitterness and bound by iniquity. So there was something spiritually wrong with the attitude that Simon carried. Now, how is this possible? How can a believer, how can a believer, a disciple, a follower of the Lord Jesus be poisoned by bitterness? and bound by iniquity. But scriptures tell us that you know, we must not open the doors to Satan. Okay? We have to shut the doors on Satan. But when we open the doors to Satan you know, through our wrong uh, uh, patterns of thinking, through sin in our lives, you know, through uh, uh, the works of the flesh, right? we are entertaining Satan. When we do things like this, what happens? Satan can come in. Okay, and uh, we can be distracted. Worse still, we can be derailed from the path that God has for us. So it's it's a warning. It's a warning. Simon is a believer. He definitely is a believer, but his attitude is not correct. He's not, uh, you know, humble and submissive before the Lord. He's not obedient to the Lord. He has become uh, poisoned by bitterness. So why did he ask for the gift of God? and try to purchase it with money. Maybe uh, competition, uh, jealousy, envy. They have it. I want it. I can become a big man. Or maybe you could even say that he did not fully deal with the pride of his past life. You know, He was uh, uh, considered the power of God among the people. Maybe he was missing that the, the feeling that you know being called the power of God you know, meant to him. And now, Nothing. Once he started following Jesus, he has none of that. But suddenly when he sees the supernatural being demonstrated through Peter and uh, John, he becomes hungry. He becomes covetous. His pride kicks in and he says, even if it takes money, I'm going to buy this so that when I lay hands on people, that these kind of supernatural things will take place. And so Peter rebukes him. Peter also calls him to repentance. And uh, he uh, speaks forth you know, what he sees in the spirit about Simon. Verse 24, thank God Simon responded positively. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. Okay, so he humbled himself. Simon humbled himself. And uh, he, he prayed, he pleaded and said, please, whatever you have said, let it never happen to me. Okay, and uh, uh, in this, we see that Simon probably went ahead and walked the path of repentance. Now, what actually happened to Simon, Simon, because it's not recorded in the book of Luke or elsewhere in the epistles, it's very hard to say. There are people, you know, extra biblical accounts where people say, yes, Simon repented and he was a faithful believer of the Lord Jesus throughout. And then there are extra biblical reports that say that, no, uh, he didn't fully repent. Uh, he carried on with his pride and, uh, you know, he... Um, wasn't a strong believer up until the end. So we don't know. These are all speculations. So we don't know uh, what happened to Simon. But he had a good response. At least verse 24. You know, he says, pray to the Lord for me uh, that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. So he recognizes the authority you know, of God, the kingdom of God, and the apostles of God. You know, at this point. So verse 25. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So mission trip is over. Okay. So basically, they've taken the, the journey back to Jerusalem, these apostles. Their intention was Samaritans be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they came, they did that. They went back to Jerusalem, but how did the mission strip come to an end? 
along the way preaching the gospel in many villages of the samaritans so they did not limit themselves only to the place where philip preached but everywhere they went come on let's make it a you know a, a, a missions program preach next preach and that's how they carried on okay so let's pause here we'll come back and we will pick up from verse 26 okay so thank you everyone 10 minute break for now